introduction about uh, our weaving heritage uh, so that you could get an understanding you know of um, the craft that you're about to learn so we started weaving you know or we've carried on our weaving tradition uh, continuously probably since our people were you know weaving woolly mammoth hair in the last ice age no, okay. and uh, when our people arrived to this continent, um, well, after the Ice Age, after the Ice Age period, um, <clears throat> when the woolly mammoths and the ancient horses died out, uh, this valley was an ancient lake where, uh, you know, where people were hunting, gathering around it, and um, that was just, you know, glacier melt. And when that dried off, we had really fertile lands mm -hmm. on the valley. Mm -hmm. So we started to domesticate corn, you know, roughly nine to ten thousand years ago. And you know, learning the environment for all that time as well. One of the early materials that we adopted is agave fibers, which is this rug. It's uh, one of the oldest textiles found in Oaxaca. It's made mm. of agave fibers. They also made sandals with them. Yeah. Um, it's a really, really uh, beautiful material. It's strong, it takes color really well, and it lasts forever. Um, and then after our ancestors domesticated corn, or well, during that time, uh, there is some early evidence in the case of Mitla, some corn kernels that date 9,000 to 10,000 mm. years ago. Yeah. Uh, which shows, you know, how our ancestors took this ancient grass which grows to a, me um, a meter tall like three feet and produces three to four kernels of corn and transform it into the plant that we now cultivate which is completely different mm -hmm. if you observe other wild oats or rice they did change but barely you know they're still recognizable compared to their wild form and the corn is just totally transformed um, so our ancestors were building, you know, a relationship with the plant by providing its needs. The plant then provided back uh, with more food for us. And uh, the same happened with many other plants, insects and animals that we use for dyes. And um, the other example is cotton. Cotton comes in different colors. Not just, there is some white cotton here. But there is also naturally brown and pinks and mm. shades of some like green cotton. Um, and uh, so our weaving heritage is really vast, you know, in this village we just have one example. Our ritual weaving technique, it's uh, back in the days was reserved for women because women are the givers of life and they would tie one end of the backstrap loom to the waist. Mm -hmm and sit on the ground, you know, the mother earth mm -hmm. was all. And the other end of the loom, they will tie to a tree, which uh, represents the cosmic tree of creation, where our spirits are tethered to and feeding from its nipples before we're born and mm -hmm. it's brought into this world. Um, and so, you know, when we weave in that ancestral way, we're uniting heaven and earth on the tapestry of life. Mm -hmm. nice. and you know, that's the truly, you know, ancestral way of, of weaving. Um, we incorporated wool, which is this type of wool that you see. It's made of criollo wool, uh, sheep, which is a combination of three breeds that the Spanish brought here through the port of Veracruz, and then they, they started to come this way through Oaxaca. They brought uh, churra, which in the U.S. got transformed as churro, sacha, and something else. They're like black-faced, four-horned mm -hmm. bishop sheeps, they're called too. Uh, very similar to the churro, but with two other breeds, they just interbred and adapted to this climate. Mm. They have a shorter staple fiber, so um, it doesn't really get that cold here. So they, they kind of adapted to that. And uh, most of this wool these days, it's, um, it's spun in a mill. It's a small mill owned by a family outside the uh, Estado de Mexico. And you know, these are like early 1900s machines that still have a leather belt wow. to run mm -hmm. the engine and they fix it themselves. 
it just makes the work easier because there is about 5,000 weavers in this village and uh, you know every family has a porch with four or six looms and there's two other weaving villages nearby Zapotec as well with like 2,000 weavers each so between these three villages we weave 12 tons of rugs per month wow. sometimes you go to the you know to another workshop or to to the craft market here and they do the little demo they spin wool for you yeah. and that's fine you know they're still educating you how those rugs are made but also sometimes you know uh, they tell tourists what they want to hear but rather than do that rather than romanticize the way we do things I want people to really understand how indigenous people have been you know working with the environment adapting and you know, really in that struggle for survival and we've we've embraced all the waves of change, technolo technological change that have come and gone. Mm. And some things we do decide to abandon, some things we do less of. Another thing uh, often weavers tell you is like, oh, we're using natural dyes and some of the workshops here, you know, even do the demo with live cochineal and squish the bug in your hand and show you with some line how this bug makes a deep red mm -hmm. and then you add lime to it and, and turns brighter, brighter orange. But then when they sell you rugs, they sell you like synthetic dye rugs. Mm -hmm. So here we know, we're just honest and we tell you, you know, you want a natural dye rug, it's going to be two or three times more expensive. If it has red and blue, those are expensive colors that already one kilogram of cochineal costs um, a thousand five hundred pesos so no i'm lying I, i'm confused it's roughly two thousand eight hundred to three thousand pesos so like 150 dollars and you know you expect a weaver to sell you a rug for like 600 pesos and mm -hmm. then be all like hand spun and you know people the first question they ask how long did it take you know mm -hmm. oh i bet it took you know but they feel so good when it took so long and they pay so little that's the romanticized version of tourism mm -hmm. and it was really bad in the 80s when um importers started to come here when we got discovered and they started to take our rugs to be sold uh as an alternative to Diné and hopi rugs in the southwest of the u.s mm -hmm. because they were bargaining down the price here and they were selling our rugs for really expensive back in the u.s and you know i i met some people that have made their own little fortunes they're now selling homes in real estate or have boats when you know the weavers here there, some of them are still struggling you know to get day by day mm. and so it was that also market force that uh, you know more demand for rugs and then lower prices people just couldn't keep up by making everything hand spun and natural dyed you know just that wave had to move that way it's probably like the spinning and the harvesting of the wool is maybe half the work or something yeah of i mean doing... uh, my grandparents probably were making 12 rugs a year yeah because they were you know still doing a lot of that they'll save a little wool here and go to markets mm -hmm. and buy gather some more from other villages because yeah. everybody has a small flock but no one has a really huge flock mm -hmm. yeah. but yeah you know it's the way uh we've adapted and in the early 2000s, we noticed a bigger appreciation for natural dye rugs, and we revived that a little bit more now. And, uh, you know, just coming to the realization that the way we're making things in our current production and consumption system, it's tr truly unsustainable. We're extracting, processing, and discarding materials. Even if we recycle, you know, it's not a complete closed-loop system. It's just delaying that material to reach the landfill. And also we've created like 6,000 chemicals since the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. that we clothe, you know, some of this cloth and paint our homes. And we are in constant contact with them. And we're just realizing how the, in the subtle effects that they're having in our health with like more cancers and, you know, what have you, that slowly some of those chemicals are being banned, but there's just so many of them. And, and then you gotta trust the companies. <laughs> Whereas uh, we have some really amazing dyes, and this is one of our favorites. We're known for the cochineal, which is a bug that grows on the cactus. It takes three months to grow, 
and uh, after three months, they copulate. The male dies a few days after that. It's smaller than the female. So all that's left are the females, which are the ones you see here. You need to harvest, I think, like a hundred leaves from the prickle pear cactus to get a pound of dye. Mm. This is, you know, a pound of dye goes up till here, which is roughly uh, 155,000 bugs. Yeah. That's, you know, a lot of painstaking work. Mm -hmm. um, and there is farms now in, in Oaxaca and elsewhere in Mexico that are cultivating this bug because it's still used a lot in the cosmetic industry to color foods and uh, yeah and also for crafts um, the amazing thing is that this bug you know makes a dye that could last up to 500 years even if it's well. exposed to sunlight and rain mm. uh, and uh, you know you've seen yesterday how yeah. you can make different shades of colors of purples reds pinks and anything in between you could keep reusing that dye vat. That dye vat that we have there, it's yeah. almost exhausted, but then we could add stuff to it, like coffee grounds. Yeah. Or when you make a salsa, you you know, you could throw the, um, the residue of the chilies, mm. and it adds to that, and you know, keep maintaining <laughs> the color. Um, the other amazing dye is the indigo, which makes the blue. Uh, so indigo, I think indigo is indigo tin is the molecule that makes blue and it's found in many plants. I'm sure you know about this. Mm -hmm. So we have our native indigo, which we call jiquilite. It has a tiny short leaf, and uh, they grow it in tea plantations. It takes two years to grow, so it's harvested every two years. Uh, out of like two hectares of of planting, they gather about. 100 kilograms of uh, of the dried material. Um, they're fermented with a local fruit and, and we use it here for dyes. Wow. So this one's everything you know? Yeah, this one that my dad wore, it's all so dyed with indigo. It's some of the basic shades. Wow. You know, from really pale ones mm -hmm. to more, mm -hmm. more. It gets darker than that, but for a large rug. This one's one of my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, just, you know, with that background, we can now uh, talk about the patterns and symbols so that we get... Uh, I think you same one. Yeah. Oh, here it is, actually. So that rug there, I'm going to put this down. It's a replication. It's a replicate of the ruins of Mikla. Oh, yeah. You can help me spread that. So you could see, you could read these patterns first as a whole. Like what you see here is the crackling of fire. Hmm. If you look at the pattern that follows it, that's like the flow of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Or even like drops of rain. It's very water-like. So then what you have next, obviously, is wind. You know, the blow of wind. Mm. And at the bottom there is nothing. There's the earth. And, and so you have the four elements, because also Mikla was like a giant Temascal, mm. and that were the, the ancient Nahuales, the ancient seers, used to do rituals with sacred plants. They were really well known across the continent. People from other nations came here to get counseling and advice on governing matters or spiritual guidance. Um, but once we start to look into these patterns and symbols, let me pull a few rugs here. So, the first pattern starts like this. This is uh, obviously synthetic dyes. You could tell the difference because natural dye rugs, um, they are intense in color, but they absorb light rather than reflect it. Hmm. It's kind of tricky, you know, yeah. even this pale, I mean, this is synthetic dye. Yeah. And you could get away telling that, oh, that's indigo dye. But mm. it does take a train. I, it's subtle, but it is still reflecting It's color. like a little yeah. shiny-ish yeah. or something. Yeah. All uniform. Whereas this is more like matte. 
mm-hmm. because uh, synthetic dyes often have heavy metals and oxides, mm-hmm. yeah. so that just naturally reflects light. Anyway, so this pattern is very uh, well known. In Mitra, it's carved on stone. Well, it's actually built with fretwork. But it's a pattern that you get when you join your hands in this way, mm-hmm. right? It's the union of the left and the right side of our awareness. Mm. The left side is called Nawal, the right side is Tonal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, like mm-hmm. feminine, masculine, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. night and day. And also the Tonal um, on the left side, our ancestors discovered that the left side of our body is specialized in certain things and the right side in other. Kind of like what scientists hint at with the left and the right side of the brain even though that's not really how it works you know it's not like one side of the brain is shut off well you know Mm -hmm. the mathematical side but it it gives that glimpse of how our body is specialized and it's this duality you know that every culture talks about like the yin and yang Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so if you notice on the left side we have our guts you know and you have intuition those gut feelings your heart is on the left for your emotions Right, so all this left side is specialized in that, and the right side, the tonal is they say that where we can create language, mm-hmm. you know, and language being the first act of creation that shapes the reality that we perceive, and then um, with language comes logic, uh, mathematics, and astronomy, and we worked on both worlds, you know, our ancestors in the sacred sites developed one of the most precise calendar systems that humankind has come up with. It took modern astronomers using atomic clocks and supercomputers to figure out that the Mayan calendar had an error of 0.019 splits of a second <laughs> per year with all the adjustments they made. Our current calendar system, just by because we had the gap year, we're still missing out a few like minutes or something yeah, that mm-hmm. eventually you know, we're going to have to readjust. Uh-huh. Right. And so, you know, on the Nawal side, you know, our ancestors were really tuned with that connection to nature to, uh, and to our dreams. Um, for them, those, re- those dreams are as, are as real as this world that we mm-hmm. could see and touch. And it was part of our chore, you know, to, to awaken that state and to reconnect with it. Because we're born like an empty vessel that needs to be refilled. Mm. Uh, you know, we we forgot everything that we already knew mm-hmm. and we're on a journey to rediscover that. And so we call this the cycle of life. When we analyze it in this way, they say that just as we have four knuckles, there's four steps. Each step represents 13, 13 years. And 13 again, is a sacred number, like 13 mm-hmm. moon cycles in a year, yeah. 13 main joint body, uh, joints in our bodies, mm-hmm. 13 roughly, 13 years for a woman to start ovulating. So really, it's a really recurring pattern. And then from 13, 26, 39 to 52, you know, we go through the growth stage of life. And every 13 years, there would be a major ritual to go through. Uh, But mainly at 52, when we reach the middle of life, and that's another uh, um, scientific, uh, uh, what do you call it? like misunderstanding because people think that oh you know ex- life expectancy has been increasing like back in the days people only lived till 50 or something but in reality they live much longer they had healthier diets all of our my great grandmothers lived till 93 and 103 wow. and in my grandmothers my great grandmothers and then my grandmothers live you know they, they really decline and who knows where my parents but you know, because of our, our modern diets and our mm-hmm. the modern chemicals. So anyway, what they say is that at 52, at the middle of life, we should turn back to look at our life experiences to create the knowledge and wisdom that we need, need to pass to the future generations. Mm. So they believe that um, we come to this world just to gather experiences. They're neither good or bad. They're things that, you know, uh, the great spirit wanted to experience, like the universe that creates itself to know itself. Mm. And when we die, those experiences are stored in our spirit and returned to the great eagle that is feeding from those experiences. And then uh, 
so that's why it's important to process all those experiences and you see in all the archaeological sites people sitting with their legs crossed doing with their back straight i'm sure you know doing some kind of meditations mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. the buddhist the vedic people the it's it's really common across the world and then the, as the line goes down we get old but then we have all those distilled experiences to share in terms of stories and then for another 13 years we walk to our death and, and you know at some point we die and then we can come back and start over the cycle of life and death mm -hmm. which we could also escape uh, because this symbol keeps curling like this uh, like, like we saw here it's very faded right but it's curling like that mm -hmm. because I mean uh, the way I see this is uh, when you take the path of the warrior and that ancient philosophy is first acknowledging that there is no life without death since mm -hmm. the moment you're born you start to die and you start a battle against death if you think about it we have to eat the right foods fend off thousands of viruses and bacteria mm -hmm. and life really you know it's that vibrant force that needs to be constantly fed and uh, there is ancient trainings for the warrior path again you know each stage is like a ritual uh, things that I've heard you know that people do from ritual hunts growing your own food feeding yourself the very first step to be alive right uh, to take some someone's life to feed someone's life to feed life right like yeah. or someone's death like mm -hmm. death feeds life yeah exactly and that you know constant cycle of life and death um, doing long walks on foot to sacred sites you know looking for those teachers um, and then there is the use of sacred plants and then there is also like um, mastering your dreams like doing like lucid dreaming mm -hmm. it was common in our culture and at the end they will put you in a life and death situation because you know when you're grounded and after you've done your training when you read stories of survival of people that are grounded you know they achieve great feats of survival you know just to save their themselves or their loved ones and and just you know being in this warrior state it's also an inner journey so this cycle you know in order to grow you dive in you know it curls within so it's that inner search that inner war this teaching later got transgressed uh, especially during some reforms of uh, the Mexicas I think with Laca Elel and some they changed the ancient teachings and they focus it more on the material things on the material world and that's why we also had a decadent period mm -hmm. when our culture was declining way before the Spanish showed up you know our homework is to remember the ancient teachings mm -hmm. you know before the decadent era took over mm -hmm. um, and that's part of you know what's going on now eventually you know warriors also they get old and die they face their, they face their death but they say they face their death with a smile you know they, they embrace it and the line keeps curling up. It's also believed that when they die, when you die in battle, in this battle, you uh, you go to a place called Tlalocan, which is a place of never-ending spring in the nine realms of heaven. Oh, yeah. That, again, uh, is depicted in this is depicted in uh, some of the sacred sites near the Pyramid of the Sun. Tlalocan. It's all called. They're not pyramids, they're called Toyanes. They're sacred sites, more like research centers. Mm. But yeah, you know, this is, this is what it looks like. This is a tiny little chunk of a huge mural, you know, that's mm -hmm. painted with a huge vision of how this Tlaloc the place where the God of the Rain lives because it's always raining, there's always flowers, fruit trees growing, and then people could go there to rejoice themselves and forget about the pains of life, mm -hmm. heal themselves, sing, and rest, mm. before they can come to be born again. After you complete your journey in the other world, um, 
if you go to um, Mictlan, the Lord and well, and the all the God or Goddess of Death, all they'll tell you is, "Dear mortal, your sufferings have ended. Mm. Go back and live your mortal dream once again." <laughs> so what if this is the dream? <laughs> yeah. uh, so eventually, they say that um, what's called you could understand as a shaman, we call them Nahuales, even though the word Nahual in uh, contemporary Mexico has been uh, uh, satanized again by the Christian uh, religion or the Catholic Church. You know, to when you say Nahual, like out in the streets these days, people think, oh, you know, he's or she is like someone who converts into an animal, an evil animal that will yeah. cause pain or illness. Mm -hmm. But the Nahuales in ancient times were the great the seers, the great masters that have achieved the union of the left and the right side of their awareness. So they could shift their awareness. They say they could be at the same time in the spiritual world and in this world mm. of day and light. They could be in the dream world and here. They could be in two places at the same time. They could also, I mean, they go as far as saying that they could transform themselves you know, into eagles or rain or fire, lightning. And I think they're just so in tune, you know, with that animal, you know, they could literally see the world through the mm -hmm. eyes of the eagle or the jaguar right. or the rain or a plant and talk to plants. And so it's more, you know, that shift of awareness that they, they practiced. And uh, if you notice too, you know, this pattern is complete now. It's the... Is the Fibonacci series, the, the golden ratio, that you know, it's a specific mathematical increase in the length of these proportions. Mm -hmm. So it's fractal uh, geometry, it's, uh, it's sacred geometry. Uh, this symbol will never change, you know, it's, we call it in Zapotec Ganekhia, which means the flowered uh, Greca. And we call it Bre Greca because uh, archaeologists when they started to study our culture you know they studied it from the eurocentric perspective so they they saw this and they thought oh the greeks also have it let's call it greca mm. Mm. but that's another interesting thing because it's these are patterns that are also linking humanity across the yeah. world mm -hmm. you know through really ancient times um and the fact that they're embedded in our body in our geometry it means that they're really really you know, speaking about us. And uh, I haven't done much ceremony, but I did a ayahuasca ceremony. And one of my main realizations were, was that, you know, we're nothing more than sacred geometry. You know, our bodies are just an expression of geometry, of that double helix, you know, DNA strands that are arranged in A, D, C, T, G in a specific way, which you could color call, right? A, D, C, T, G, or any of these patterns. And sound, you know, mm. it could represent it, it could be represented geometrically. Yeah. And, uh, and what are waves but particles? And, and then everything gets really trippy, <laughs> <laughs> just by talking about those things. But, uh, but yeah, you know, um, Another thing that I noticed too, for example, is that Mongolians have this pattern. The Ainu people in Japan has th have this pattern. Obviously, you know, in what we call Tawantinsuyo uh, in South America or, you know, around the Inca culture, mm -hmm. all the way to Central America and all the way to um, what we call uh, Semanawak, what you call North America. There is cultures that share the same patterns and symbols because, well, first of all, we've been trading a lot and we've been moving around a lot too. And, and some of us are, are probably related, you know, of people coming north, back and forth. Uh, but, you know, the fact that also such distant cultures have the same symbology, you know, in Nepal you see similar symbols. Some people say, is the fact that the weft which is the color colors and the the warp is are the threads that run lengthwise so you have a, a little matrix they say oh the fact that you have this matrix you know it's easy to do either squares or triangles and that's why everybody created the same patterns and i'm saying no because before that 
our ancestors were also making these patterns and painting them on balls. Mm -hmm. And to make these geometric patterns on balls, it's really hard, you know, to paint mm -hmm. something on a round circumference. It's really hard to achieve that same geometry. And then the Mongolians uh, are um, uh, felting. So they don't even have the, that great pattern and they spend the time to create this exact pattern. So, you know, what I see that it's, you know, that ancient um, heritage that we all had maybe 50 or 60,000 years ago as we were emigrating in Africa and we were still carrying some of those ancient stories mm. of, of the wisdom that we all have as humanity. And part of the reasons why I share this and we're so openly talking about this now is that it's something that we need to remember. You know, we all have an ancestral lineage that has this linking us, you know, 50 or 60,000 years ago. And part of the problem in this world is that we've forgotten those ancient teachings. You know, we've forgotten to live according to our ancestors. And that's why this culture is so, uh, it's growing so fast, but it's, it's so crumbly, it's so feeble. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the changes that need to be made need to, you know, be rooted in this ancestral wisdom and in the way that we make things you know maybe we cannot go back to do all but maybe it is possible you know to do a ritual weaving to make all of our clothes mm. the grandma spent a year making a piece of clothing that will last them a lifetime mm -hmm. that will get buried with them or they will inherit to their granddaughters that's the true definition of slow fashion everything else is just a fact yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I could go on forever.